In this video, I want to give you a sample of what you can expect from my latest course, Fluids 1. This goes into the overview of how a flip simulation works. And with this background knowledge, it really helps you piece together a lot of the clues as to how a fluid solver works in general and why things work the way they do. So I hope you enjoy this quick tip. And if you find it useful, then check out the entire course at cgforge.com. So let's now go over how a flip simulation generally works. The term flip stands for fluid implicit particle. And this whole set of math equations and figuring out fluid dynamics actually came about fairly recently, specifically in the 1980s and then further refined in 2005 with a series of equations that basically combines a particle simulation with a volume based simulation. So that's a good way of thinking about it. A flip simulation is kind of like a combination between what you have in a pop net and what you might have with a typical pyro solver or a volume solve. Now, the first question you might ask is why use both particles and volumes? What's the reasoning for that? Well, think of it like this. The particles are going to be good at certain tasks specifically if we're talking about particles that use Lagrangian calculations, more on that later, they're good at maintaining data. The data sticks with the particle as a particle moves around, that data is not lost. And we have accurate advection values that we have in velocity. So if you apply a velocity vector to a particle, it's going to move in a very accurate way. And not only does that preserve the data, but it gives us a very accurate velocity when it goes to move. Volumes, on the other hand, are not so great at giving you accurate values. They actually lose values over time very easily. But they're really good for figuring out pressure and incompressibility, which basically means that volume solvers or volume solves are really good at finding the areas of least resistance and telling the volume to go in that direction. I'll show you some visual examples here in a minute, so this will all come together. But volumes are good at that. They're good at figuring out where to go in the direction of least resistance. And volumes are bad at preserving data. There's all sorts of rounding errors that happen. It's very easy to lose values. They're not good at keeping accurate values as things become advected. And so, what happens is that we take the best of both worlds with flip. We use the particles to allow the accurate transfer of values without losing any values like you would in a volume simulation. And at the same time, we're able to get more accurate fluid movements because we can get a great pressure solve when using the volume simulation. So in other words, we take the best of both worlds and that's why FLIP, the fluid implicit particle, is the standard when it comes to fluid simulations. But I know that it was all probably pretty confusing. <laughs> so let me show you some visual examples. And this will be a lot easier to uh, see how this all comes together. In this first example, we have a very simple particle simulation. There's really nothing but just a sphere emitting particles and it's hitting the ground. So nothing in here is telling these particles to act like a fluid yet. And I want you to notice that no matter what we do, these particles are not stacking on top of each other. The volume of this fluid is not accumulating over time, right? If you were to picture this was maybe like a water spout of some kind, that's water, that fluid should build up over time, and it should also spread out over the ground. Now, in the early days of computer graphics, before the invention of flip simulations, the general way that we would try to fix this is by creating a force between each particle to try to create an even separation, an even distance away from all the particles. So we can actually do that here with a pop interact. And this pop interact will tell the particles to move away from each other if they're within a certain radius around every single particle. 
So with this position force, let's set this to a value of three. The core radius, let's set this to 0 0.05. And don't worry about this fall off. We'll set that to zero for right now. So if we do this and I press play, the particles will try to separate out from each other. And now we're starting to get that ground interaction where they're moving away. And it's kind of hard to see it here, but we are starting to actually get a little bit of this accumulation happening because as a particle is on the ground, let's say, it's gonna look at a nearby particle that's on top of it and push some of them upwards, which again, kind of helps us accumulate these values a bit better. However, this still doesn't do a very good job of that. And so there's been a lot of additional advancements in this general idea where we keep an even separation. And what we use instead in Houdini, if you wanted to go this route, would be the pop fluid node. This pop fluid, again, is going to try to keep an equal distance away from every single particle, but it does so using constraints. And it actually takes one point and it tries to create even constraints around the nearby particles. So if we take a look at this and play this forward, you'll notice that we're getting a much better example of this. The fluid is fanning outwards on the ground, which is good. We are getting a little bit of volume and we can start really seeing that right about there. See how we have this general slope that goes up right there? And it's basically a similar thing that we did with the pop interact, except that we rely on multiple constraints to try to keep an even distance from every single particle. However, this approach also comes with some downsides. Because you see, if you were to actually drop a spigot of water on the ground, it wouldn't take very long for that water to travel on the ground and shoot outwards. It should actually hit the ground and shoot out in all directions pretty darn quickly. And this takes a full 120 or so frames to finally start fanning out like this. So just as I was saying in the diagram before, the particles are not good at figuring out an accurate pressure solve. In other words, they're not good at finding the directions of least resistance. You see, if I was to draw over this and ask you, which direction is the direction of least resistance if let's say water goes down and it needs to go somewhere from here? Well, the direction of least resistance is not up where more water is coming down. It's not down where you have the ground plane. No, it's shooting horizontally along this ground. That's the direction of least resistance. And if you do a pressure solve, that solve is going to find that direction and send particles towards that area of least resistance. So particles by themselves, and even with this pot fluid node, they're not good at figuring that out. Because as, again, we just said, 120 frames, and we're still barely spreading out along the surface. Let's compare that to a volume simulation. This goes down, and look at that. It has a much easier time finding the areas of least resistance, making that pressure soft. Specifically, it uses a gas project non-divergent node, but that's all fancy talk for finding the area of least resistance and going in that direction. However, volumes have their own problems. They easily lose values over time, and I'm not gonna get into why that is, but volumes have a hard time preserving information. And so that's why we lose a lot of this density as it reaches the end of this animation and as we reach the edges along here. And now with flip, we don't have any of those issues. We have the particles heading in the direction of least resistance. So it actually has a volume field that's making that pressure calculation. It sends the particles in that direction and we maintain all of the information because it's attached to the particles and we're not relying on the volumes to keep that information. So that's the main idea behind flip. And that's why this gets used 
as opposed to the old fashioned way when it was just particles and as opposed to just using volume only simulations. This gives us the best of both worlds. Another reason why we do this hybrid method is because points allow us to have very detailed velocities. In other words, it's very good at solving for detailed advection. However, volumes are good at just approximating the general direction of things, and it's a little bit more difficult to get detailed advection with volumes because, again, things are just a bit more generalized than they are with particles. So by having particles, we can apply particle forces and get a lot of detail. That would not be possible if it was just a volume only simulation. Another thing to keep in mind, particles are really bad at maintaining their volume. In other words, they're very bad at maintaining their shape. When I say volume here, I mean the actual like volume of the, the fluid. It's kind of confusing when you're reading this and people talk about the volume of the volume, right? <laughs> uh, but anyway, again, my point here is that particles, they have a hard time maintaining their shape. They will collapse on each other very easily. Even if you have constraints, even if you're trying to apply forces to separate them out. And just as a quick example to this, look what happens when I have a pop fluid fill up this square container. We start getting some volume right here, but it really slows down the accumulation after about right here. So it's not filling up very fast at all. And at a certain point, you come to a near standstill as far as its ability to correctly enforce the constraints and maintain the volume. Because again, those particles are collapsing upon each other. Uh, you could try adding more particles. You could try adding more constraint iterations to this. However, as I was just saying, it's one of the downsides to the particles. They have a hard time maintaining volume. And this is a good example of just that. So that's not so great. Volumes, like the actual VDB, the voxels, they have an easy time, an easier time, maintaining a consistent shape. And the reason why volumes have an easier time maintaining their shape is because they rely on something called Eulerian equations or Eulerian methods. What that basically means is that these voxels are fixed in their locations. They're not moving around. X, Y, Z, the space that each voxel occupies doesn't change. And for that very reason, it's able to use equations in such a way that keeps track of where the water should and should not be. When we have the Lagrangian equations, so when we do this, that's basically saying the particles, they move around in space through X, Y, Z. And because of that fact, they're not really fixed in one location and it's a little bit more difficult to keep track of where fluid should and should not be. That is the easy <laughs> explanation as to why volumes preserve their volume better. It's mostly because their location is fixed in space. And again, it's easier to keep track of where they should be when these guys are not moving around. And so, Depending on the issue at hand, sometimes volumes are going to behave better. Sometimes particles are going to behave better. And that's just another reason why this hybrid system works really, really well when it comes to representing accurate fluid dynamics. In the next video, let's move on by talking about this process a bit more. And hopefully we'll be able to start pairing these ideas with specific parameters that we have within the flip solver. If you enjoyed this sneak peek at Fluids 1, then check out the rest of the course at cgforge.com. Thanks for watching and I hope you have a great day.